Hey, thanks, Mark, for coming on. Hey, for thanks those for you, having me. Oh, anytime. So for those of you who don't know, if you're listening and not watching, uh, our guest tonight is Mark James. Mark James is a retired school teacher. And high school. High school teacher. Yes. And you have, um, uh, you taught biology, right? Mostly biology. Uh, probably 80% biology and 15% earth science and 5% physical science. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, other than um, you're my father-in-law, but you have a vast knowledge. I mean, you know a lot. You, you know a little bit about a lot, and you know a ton about stuff that I know nothing about, as you've learned over the last six years. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that I was hoping we could talk about is um, you have a fascination um, with... Um, Fossils, which you brought some fossils here I did. Uh, to go over, but also um, astronomy, and I don't know anything about astronomy, nothing. And as a matter of fact, you know, before we we went on the we started recording, you were kind of excuse me explaining the difference to me between astronomy and astrology. Correct. Ast- astronomy is basically the study of the universe. So you're basically, in astronomy, you're studying pretty much everything outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, So it can include stars, other planets, uh, asteroids, uh, the different kinds of stars, not only the stars far away, but our home star, the sun and our moon and the way planets are formed throughout the universe, how the universe is made up, black holes, uh, comets. I mean, all of that's part of astronomy. And then astrology is more of a uh, horoscope, uh, how the stars are foretelling your future type of, of thing. It's more of the magical side of it. That's the fun side. That's the well, side a lot of people deal with. Side. Yeah, a lot of people like read their horoscopes every day mm-hmm. uh, uh, to see you know what the stars say is going to happen. But uh, the 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 way that your astrological sign is determined is when you're born. Yeah. During the day, when the sun is overhead. Out in space, whatever constellation mm-hmm. the sun is in, because the constellations, you know, they're the constellations, if you ever had looked at no, the constellations. I don't know. Assume a, I know nothing. A, because const- I know a constellation nothing. Is, is a formation of stars that, that our ancestors thought looked like something. You have swans, you have. Uh, Orion and his belt and and all of that, but you have all these constellations. Well, there there are constellations that, th- as the sun and the everything moves around and the, and the Earth spins, and the sun's position on a certain constellation uh, changes. So, like I'm born in May. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm a Taurus. Which Taurus is May's astrological sign, but you can't see Taurus in the sky in May. I have to wait to December. It's six months after your birthday that you can go out at night, look up, and your astrological sign will be in the sky above you, because it's when it's when you're placed in that sign. It's when the sun is in that constellation. And so, in May, if you went out at night and looked up, there is no Taurus. So you can see a Taurus. Yeah. But it's six months after May. So it's like the winter sky is when I see Taurus all the time. Like November, December, January, February is when I see Taurus. So when uh, in December, when we walk outside, how are you going to identify, show me how to look up and go, look, there's the Taurus? Well... You pretty much have to pull up on the internet um, the <coughs> constellation and just see what it looks like. Okay. And uh, and it's fairly easy to find. Uh, 
but it is it is a bull with two horns and so the stars you just have to look for that pattern so if you pull up the constellation Taurus um, when you look at it if you go out in December and pretty much like six months from your birthday it's like at midnight it would be straight overhead so it's fairly simple to find usually some of the constellations are easier to pick out like Orion mm -hmm. with the three stars for the belt very easy to pick out because you've got the three stars for the Orion's belt and then you have two bright stars for the shoulder and two bright stars for his hip and one of those is reg uh, one of those is uh, Betelgeuse uh, which Betelgeuse is a very interesting star uh, but Orion's very easy to find. So when I look up and I try to find Orion, I feel like I can see the three stars. Yeah. But then as I look, I feel like, well, look, there's three more stars. So I yeah. get lost. Well, the thing with Orion's three stars is, number one, they're very close together. And they're for, for three stars close together, they're all bright. But isn't one like down just a little just or a something? Tad. Just a yeah, tad. it's a slight curve. Uh, but Orion... Uh, is a hunter. Uh, he's got his belt, uh, his shoulders. He's got a. He's got a. Well, some people have him with a sword. Some people have him with a bow. But usually, you can see the sword, and uh, but you can pick out the parts. But they had good imaginations back then. Apparently so. Yeah. Is there a? Um, is there? A, What's your sign? I'm a Taurus. We're oh, both Taurus. Oh, that's right. That's right. You're yeah. A Taurus. Yeah. Okay. That's why I yeah. said when we walk outside in yes, December. Yes, in December. But. Yeah. But yeah, you to see your sign, just look up your sign star pattern for what you are, and then six months from when your birthday is, that's when to go out and look up. And um, you were so even when I walk outside and look up at the stars, I have a hard time even finding the North Star because every all of them look bright, <laughs> and I'm like, nope, that's definitely the, well, the North, North Star. Star is not bright. The North, Hence why I've never found it, apparently. The North Star is is dim. And what you do is well, you I've, use the Big Dipper. You find the Big Dipper, which the Big Dipper is easier to see. And We're seven minutes in. My mind's already blown. You, it's a good thing I wasn't lost in the friggin' woods yeah. with you know a pack of wolves hunting me yeah. and me looking for the North Star to get out. Well, Otherwise, and the I North Star dead. is great to find. But if you find the Big Dipper... The Big Dipper's to the north also. Okay. So, and the Big Dipper looks like a Big Dipper. And you can actually use stars on the Big Dipper, on the cup of the Big Dipper, the last two stars. You can follow, if you do a straight line on the last two, like you got a handle yeah. and a dipper. So if you take these two stars and go straight up, it points to the North Star. But it's not a bright star. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't even say it's a medium bright star. It's a it's a upper level dim star, but you can see it. I'm going. To, I should put a star cheat sheet in my wallet, so if I'm when I become lost in the middle of nowhere, I can get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. But if it's night, and you can find the Big Dipper because the Big Dipper does have a very distinct and it's large. The Big Dipper points to the North Star, but if you find the Big Dipper and you're looking at the Big Dipper, you're looking north. I mean, that's probably mm. that's basically the direction north anyway, even without Polaris, which is the name of the North Star. There was a time where uh, my cousin and I, we went coon hunting. He's a coon hunter. He used to be a pretty avid coon hunter. Well, we parked the truck and we're walking into the woods that we weren't familiar with. And sure enough, he was like, oh, no, you know, where did we park? And I said, well, I remember looking up at the moon, and I remember the position of the moon when we left. So I walked back towards the position of the moon. Well, guess what? The moon moves. Yeah. It didn't work out so it well. Moves. The, the, <laughs> moon, the moon appears to move. The moon appears not to move. You're correct. When you're just looking at it. That's right. But if you ever use a telescope, and you put it on the moon, you have about 20 seconds to look at the moon, and the whole time you're looking at it, it's moving out of frame because it's moving that fast. So once you zero in on the moon with your telescope and you take your hands off and you're sitting there looking at it, it's going out of frame the whole time, and you have 
like 20 seconds to look at it before it's gone and you got to move the telescope to find it again. Yeah, you don't want to get lost with me oh. and, and, and depend on me to find our way yeah. out of here. Well, and you ha- I mean, if, if you're in a spot, it never hurts to sort of look up at the stars, moon, uh, see where your brighter stars are and the direction. And like, if there's a bright star over here and you're going to walk away from it, yeah. then when you're lost, you just say, well, there's that bright star and you just walk back toward it. Okay. You know, sort of get some bearings before. I mean, that's the way that our ancestors did stuff. All they did all everything was star oriented. I mean, even what well, people still use it, but back then it was life or death, which is why we have so many ancient monuments that are star and planet oriented, like they uh, Stonehenge and all of those things are all like there's a crack right here and. The longest day of the year, the sun will be right in that crack. Then there's a crack over here. The shortest day of the year, the sun will be right in that crack. And they, they know exact. You know, they that tells them what time of the year it is and what's going on. And and planets coming up, like our planets follow patterns. So at a certain time of year, Mars comes up. And they may have a little mark for where Mars would come up, bright red star, which to them was a bright red star, but. But it's and, it, and it's sort of different because they learned long ago that which is why we call them planets because the word planet means wanderer because they learned long ago that your stars that are stars mm-hmm. they don't move like all your stars stay in the exact same place night after night after night month after month after month all the stars are in the exact same position but then they would have these stars that it would be here, and then a month later, the star, in relationship to all the other stars, mm-hmm. would have moved, and it moved, and they were wanderers, and the word planet means wanderer because the planets don't stay in the same position because they're following their elliptical paths around the sun, which make them move. Now, Mars right now is going to be the closest to Earth that it's been since 2003 on July the 27th of this year. And it's gonna be another 15 years before it's this close. Um, It's gonna be around 35 million miles away, which seems like a long way. Yeah. But on average, Mars is 145 million miles away. Can be 250 million miles away. When When the sun's in the middle, and Earth's over here and Mars is over there, we can be 250 million miles away. But July 27th, the sun's gonna be here, the Earth's gonna be in the middle, and Mars is gonna be on the other side of the Earth. So you're gonna have the sun, Earth, and Mars, which that's that's called Mars will be in opposition. When you have the sun, Earth, and Mars, it's said that Mars has reached opposition, which happens July 27. So will we be able to see Mars? We can. Mars is going to move up in rank and brightness. Um, Mars usually is is it, it's a half decent brightness yeah. for a planet. Um, thing that helps you to pick out Mars is its redness because it, when you look up, it is a red star. I mean, it gives off red light. There are red stars. But when you look up in the night, look for the brightest red-looking star, mm-hmm. most likely Mars. Um, it's it's probably, you would look to the south. Uh, right now, right when the sun sets, like now, for just a few minutes, you can see Mercury. Mercury will be up. Mercury is close to the sun, like real close. So most of the time we can't see Mercury. So what has to happen is Mercury's got to be on, in a position with the sun to where the sun <coughs> sets and Mercury is up, still up to where on Earth we can see it. Because if it's on, if it's within the zone of the sun or behind the sun, we can't see it. And if it's below the sun, it sets before the sun does. So the sun's too bright, you still can't see it. So when, when Mercury is up higher on this side of the sun and the sun sets, 
for just a short brief period of time above the tree line, you can see this little star right above where the sun set, and that's Mercury, but it will shortly set with the sun not long after. But um, Saturn's visible right now. Um, Mars is visible right now, but Mars is going to get to be the fourth brightest light in the sky g this month. It'll be Sun's number one, Moon's number two, Venus is number three, and Mars will be number four. Mars usually doesn't hold that position. Mars is usually farther down on brightness, but but this month, because it's going to be only 35 million miles away, it's going to be way brighter. I mean, it's basically walking from here to Troutland. Astronomically speaking, yes. Yes. It's It puts it in a very close proximity. So it's great for scientists uh, in observatories and things around the world for just getting real good pictures of, of Mars because when it's this close. But it only gets this close, like, like I said, I mean, most of the time it's like 15 years. And you were um, speaking of, of planets. Um, there was an article just within like the last week or something to where they were using the largest telescope looking these scientists in Chile and actually saw the formation of a planet. You're, well, a planet in the process of forming, yes. Uh, they think it's a gas planet. Probably, if you think of our planets, it's probably most like Jupiter. It's like a giant gas planet, but it's it's around a dwarf star. Uh, What's a dwarf star? You have dwarf stars which are just very they're on in the star world. Mm -hmm. Dwarf stars are like your smaller ones. Uh, so basically, in star world, I would be a dwarf star. Could be, yes, <laughs> yes. But you have, you have, you have dwarf stars. Our sun is considered a medium-sized star. Okay. Um, uh, and then you have giant stars, like uh, you have giant red stars. Uh, Betelgeuse is a giant blue star. Um, if you ever look on the internet and look at star pictures, star mm -hmm. patterns, you'll see all different colors of stars. Like, they'll be white, yellow, orange, uh, blue, red. And the um, different colors just mean how close they are, what they're burning, or? It's, it's their temperature. It's their temperature. Their temperature, yes. Okay. Um, blue stars are cool. Um, basically, our star, the real bright white stars, mm -hmm. like <clears throat> real white, um, tend to be maybe younger, hotter burning stars. Um, and then, you know, they'll transition as they get older and are using up their fuel. They'll start going to yellow, then they'll go to orange, and then they'll go to red. And as they use up their energy, as they use up their, if they, as they convert hydrogen to helium, which they're doing at an astonishing rate, but you'd think they would burn out way earlier than they do. Uh, but um, as they burn it up and convert the hydrogen to helium, they begin to grow trying to absorb more energy from somewhere. And of course, then they'll start eating the planets. Like as our sun gets older, it'll eventually eat Mercury and then it'll eat Venus and Earth and Mars and, and it'll just get bigger and bigger and red and eventually it'll either nova or supernova um, which it'll blow out its outer gases then it'll sort of go out and then it'll recollapse back in and could turn into a neutron star which are what create black holes neutron stars tend to be at the center of black holes and their gravitational pull is so strong that light can't leave it which is what makes it a black hole See, this is why I think a part of my brain turned this off in high school. And this is why I can't watch Agent Aliens now, because my mind cannot wrap around us being sucked into a black hole. Now, I do realize that this is probably going to happen in my lifetime, but you never know.
Right. Because, <clears throat> I mean, we have found <coughs> black holes, like, in the universe. What do you say we found them? Like, how close to the universe? Like, 35 well, million miles they away? they actually came up with, a, with an idea that at the center of every galaxy, mm-hmm. there is a black hole. And we're in a galaxy right now called right. the Milky Way. Yeah, we're in the Milky, we're, we're Way, the Milky galaxy, Way which is a spiral galaxy. So it's very possible we're next door to a black hole. Well, we're in an outer ring band, and the center of our galaxy is a long way from here. Um, but uh, but they do have rogue black holes that just roam around. Of course, there's always one. Yeah, but and then and then of course you know. A, our biggest threat is more of from asteroids than it is from a black hole. I mean, black holes are bad. I mean, they gobble up suns, and I mean, anything they get near, they eat because their gravitational pull is so strong, they just suck everything and anything into them. The black hole sounds like it's that bad friend yeah. that just sucks you into doing bad stuff that yeah. you normally wouldn't do. Yeah. There's always that one. Yeah, but if it gets close to a sun, it'll just... It'll just start sucking the energy off. So your sun will be out here, and there'll be a, a spiral tail of energy going into the black hole, and it just disappears into there. Because it just sucks it in. Right. And it's the gravity's so strong. Like, you know when you take a flashlight and you turn on, the beam shoots out? Yeah. Okay, if you were in a black hole and you turn the light on, it wouldn't. there would be no beam. Because the, the gravity's so strong, the, the photons that make up the light beam... Yep can't go anywhere. But they how can't do we leave. know that? Like, did someone see this? Like, who lived, like, who got thrown into the wormhole and, <laughs> and got spit out and was like, you're not going to believe this shit. Einstein. I was stuck in this black hole. Yeah. I went to go turn on my LED light and the thing didn't work. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, I got spit yeah. out. I know. And here yeah. I am, but I'm telling you about it. Well, the whole thing was... Is there a chance this is all BS? I, I guess because we actually have not ever experienced a black hole. Uh, we've never created a black hole, even though I did see an experiment one time where they were trying to, but I thought this could be dangerous. But anyway, <laughs> they were doing an experiment. They were trying to make a real little <coughs> black hole, but um, yeah, I think I've, yeah, Donna, I can't, but don't, don't people at home. Don't try to make your own black hole, No, but there are so many things that are hypothetical. Yeah. Um, black holes are one and see if it's a black hole there's no light so if you're looking at it in space it's not like a star where you're seeing a bright dot and you can study the light coming off of it mm-hmm. it's dark Yeah, it's sort of like if you put a black piece of paper hanging off a tree in your front yard and you went to look at it in the middle of the night the black piece of paper really not going to be seen that well because now, if you hung a flashlight from the tree, you could see it. Right. But a piece of black paper hanging out in the dark of night. So a lot of it's theoretical. The whole thing with with uh, wormholes and, and... And time travel and that tra- sort of thing. And, yeah. Well, traveling from this point in the universe to this point in the universe quickly, which we have in all our movies. Oh, like yeah. when they go to warp speed and all this stuff, mm-hmm. and all the stars are, you know, in the movie goes, you know, and they can go from here to there in no time at all. But the, you know, the whole concept, I think I have a piece of paper, but the whole concept, oh, there's Here's a piece, a piece of paper. paper. <clears throat> I have a guest that I want to come on who wants to share their theory about time travel. Or I'm sorry, Luke, yeah, time travel. Well, the whole concept of time travel is, is you got the universe here and you got the universe here. And let's say that 700 light years away. Okay. Which means traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 700 years going the speed of light to get from this point to this point. Okay. So the concept is you can use energy in space to bend space and you bend space to where the two points are together and you poke through so you go from this point to this point instantaneously, and then you unfold space, and now you're over here, but you traveled pretty quick, like instantly, 700 light years. So there's a, I think this is something um, very similar to on Netflix called Stranger Things, where they get caught in the, 
in the below or whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's a cave or whatnot the kids aren't supposed to go into near, near the nuclear power plant. And basically, if I remember, it's been a while since I watched it, but basically this is it. They get stuck in this time wormhole time and they get stuck but they are looking and can see what's going on but no yeah. one can see them they've disappeared yeah so to speak and add the longer they're in the below they're getting sick oh right which you know that adds to the whatever but this is but for those of you listening and not watching mark is holding the piece of paper and basically from one end of the paper to the other end of the paper would take 700 years 700 Light years. Light years. Which we can't uh-huh. travel the speed of light yet. So I mean, basically we a long have time. we have spacecraft that we can get at a, what we would on Earth consider fast. Uh huh. But we have have as of yet we have not created a vehicle unless the government's hiding it. But we have not created a vehicle that can travel the speed of light. Elon Musk is working on that. Yeah. Probably. That's but, another podcast. But. When you measure stuff in space, you always do it in light years. How long it would take you to get there. And like, like the next the closest star to us besides our sun, yeah. which our sun is a star, but the next closest star to us is four light years away. So if we could travel the speed of light to get to the next star would take you four years to get there, four years to get back, and then of course you can piddle around while you're there. So, but <laughs> yeah. but you, if you're gonna, that's why most of the time we have a Starbucks there. Maybe, but <laughs> most of the time when they're looking at space travel, because space is so vast, it takes so long to get anywhere. You either are gonna have to send out ships just like in the movies you're going to have to send out ships with families on them and they're going to have to live on the ships and the adults with children or the adults are going to have children on the way and then grandchildren or great grandchildren might arrive at the place you're going and the people who started out on the mission have passed away because it takes so long to get somewhere it's almost like history repeating itself selling for the new world yeah, sort of like Battlestar Galactica. Yep, never seen it. Oh, Battlestar Galactica <laughs> was that. It's just thing. seen a look of disappointment. I, oh, well, you're not a sci-fi person. I'm not. No, but in Battlestar Galactica was the the concept was people had left Earth in all these ships, and it was whole communities. You would have they had uh, uh, ships that grew food. They had ships that had families on. They had medical ships. They had they had all of this stuff all traveling in the convoy together through space. And that's pretty much how we would have to do it. Un- but that's how they did it, what, back in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, when they yeah. were exploring, you know, yeah. the new world or looking well, for like it. when they first sent the first people over to form a colony, they sent men, women, and Virginia Dare was born here as the first mm-hmm. person born in the new world. And, and, yeah, I mean, you pretty much have to send men and women and start a colony, right. and just like we did here, it's just in space. So, I feel like most likely we're either probably before we take a big leap out, mm-hmm. we're probably <clears throat> gonna start with a colony on the moon or a colony on Mars. Mars would actually be more hospitable. Mars is temp. Well, Mars has a better gravity. Okay. Uh, Mars. Temperature is not as brutal as the moon. Mars's temperature, I mean, there's. Is it similar to Earth or is it a little bit hotter, a little colder? Both. I mean, oh. at night it gets real cold. Mm-hmm. But there are times in on Mars where, I mean, they have 80, deg- uh, 80 degrees for a high in a day. But it can get hotter. But they, it, it's just, but on the moon, if you're on the sunny side of the moon, mm-hmm. it's hot. If you're on the dark side of the moon, it's real cold. So the moon's not quite as hospitable, whereas on 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 Mars it, it would be. A, now I, I understand the entire hospitable. Pink Floyd album, "Dark Side of the Moon." Now yes. I get it. Yes, "Dark Side of the Moon," 
And the dark side of the moon is always the dark side of the moon. That's a weird thing about our moon. It just, it never, it doesn't rotate. Is that what? It rotates, but it rotates at the exact same speed as the, s- the earth going around it. So, I, I mean, it going around the earth. It, gotcha. It rotates at the exact same speed as it goes around the earth. So the same side is always looking to earth. You never see the backside. See, we never seen the backside of the moon until we sent probes up there when we were getting ready to land, trying to land on the moon. Yeah. Because you you couldn't see it. it I mean, the moon ne- the moon goes around, it makes one turn a month. Right. And it, Well, every 28 days, and it goes all the way around the Earth once every 28 days. So you'll always see the face of the moon. You never see the other side. Fascinating. Which is... There's a lot of things, not getting into religion greatly, but there are so many things about the way things work. It just is almost inconceivable that it just randomly happens. <laughs> right. It's like <coughs> that the moon would s- rotate at the exact same speed that it went. It would rotate on its axis at the exact same speed as it goes around the Earth to where the exact same side always points to the earth. That's odd. It's also very odd, I feel, that when there's an eclipse Mm -hmm. of the sun, Mm -hmm. that when there's a total eclipse, the size of the moon, being much closer to earth, is the exact size to cover the disk of the sun, which is much farther away, but it pretty much is an exact Match. Perfect match. Yeah. Now you went and watched the eclipse, the total eclipse. Yes. Right. You drove down to South Carolina, hotel room, the whole thing with your wife. Yes. <laughs> you did, which is also your daughter. Yes. Yes. And how how was it? I didn't go. Oh, it's great. Uh, and there's another one coming up, I think in 2020. Uh, a, a total. A total eclipse, but it. Whereas we went to South Carolina to see it this time. We're going to have to go northwest to see it this time. Uh, it's going to go more like Texas and north of us and up to New England. But it's going to be total, but it's still drivable. I mean, you still could drive there in less than a day to get in the total zone. Would you, do you think you would do that one? Go see it again? We've already talked about it, yes. Okay. And picking out a city to go to. That's in the total zone. Uh, yeah, it was it was very 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 interesting. Do you to, know what I'm going to do? It. What I'm going to go online and buy a ton of those glasses that you can buy like a hundred for two bucks. Oh, and I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna store them in the garage, and I'm gonna sell them for twenty bucks a pair. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Cause yes. I mean, there was. Now we used. Uh, we used uh, welder welder's mask glass. Right. Uh, it has. But they it, even sold out of that. Yeah. It has to be. Uh, I'm not sure what the the number means, but I know I was told I have to buy a twelve or. I think they sell glass in different numbers right. for welder's mask, and I was told you have to have a mask that has a number twelve. To fourteen, okay. And I talked to the people at the welding place, and they said we don't really ever sell fourteens. Said our people, twelves are for the worst, brightest lights the welders use. That twelve should be quite adequate, and we used a twelve and didn't have any trouble. But it's a it's a piece of glass about I don't know six inches by four inches. You just, just hold it, just hold it up, and look through it, and it it was great. Yeah. But I'd love but, to know how many it's good dummies looked up at the sun and not good had eye damage. Yeah, I that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, I haven't heard any. I just know it can happen. Actually, it might be sad to see the number of people that did it. I know, but what it does is <coughs> the you can look at it when it's in total eclipse because mm-hmm. the brightness is gone. But you can't look at it uh, any other time because. It, the sun is so bright, it, it, it'll it burn a, a space on your retina. Something interesting that um, I was talking, I didn't even know this, about, the, and you and I meant, we were talking about earlier, the Voyager. 
The yeah. two satellites that are up into space right now? Voyager 1, Voyager 2. They were sent to study all the planets in our solar system. Yeah. One of them studied um, one set of planets. The second one studied some of the same planets, but also went farther out and, and actually got the outermost planets, um, even Pluto, um, back when it was classified as a planet. Um, and so, which that um, totally screwed up the 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 riddle I learned in school. Yes, was it my very educated mother just ordered nine pizzas or whatever it was? Something you rattled off, and yeah. Went, but Pluto's no longer a planet. No, they count it as a micro planet now. Uh, it may be reinstated someday. I mean, it actually, you know why? Because it's being drawn into a wormhole. Uh, <laughs> That's why. Well, it actually, I mean, it actually has two moons. Um, of its own, but it's not. Our moon mm -hmm. is one of the largest moons in the whole solar system. Um, our, our moon is quite large considering what moons usually are. And uh, Pluto is, is, is not really much different in size than our moon, but it actually has two moons that, that do orbit it, orbit it. But it, it, there are so many things that don't match all the other planets. Like all the other planets are in precise elliptical orbits that all pretty much mirror each other. And then you have Pluto, and it's like this long elliptical, narrow elliptical line that just goes like, like all, oh, whoops. all the other ones are, are like pretty much slight, like maybe egg shaped slightly. But yeah, Pluto's orbit is so far out of line from all the other planets, but it does orbit the sun. So it just takes it a long time to do it because it's so far out. Could you imagine if you're the guy who discovered Pluto and now you have to give all your medals back? You're yeah. like, so we've about been, that. Yeah, we've been demoted. <laughs> yeah. Um, Can I have that medal back? Because uh, you were wrong. So, but they are... We do have the technology now to look out and find other planets that are out there. They're 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 looking for other Earth-like planets, and the big question is, well, how can you tell if it's Earth-like? Yeah. And again, it all has to do with light. Light. They they have instruments that read light, and different elements give off different readings out of in light. So you can catch light from this uh, star system way many light years away. You can catch light from that star and it can tell you if it's got, of course you're looking for hydrogen oxygen. If you've got a high hydrogen oxygen turnout, you know you've got water. Or they could just go to Chile and zoom into the big telescope and see if everyone's on their cell phones. True. Then it's like, oh yeah, it's just like Earth. True, but we're watching the Kardashians. Yeah, <laughs> but it is. I mean, it is. It is very interesting uh, with with space and how much there is. And um, like um, Hubble Telescope has mm -hmm. been up for twenty five plus years, and uh, Hubble has taken some magnificent, magnificent pictures. I mean, just tens of thousands of them. But all the pictures are black and white. The pictures come back, and scientists go back to measuring light. They they take light from what Hubble took a picture of yeah. to determine what colors it has, and then they basically Photoshop the colors into oh, it. Oh, so the stuff we see on TV that is color has been Photoshopped with color based on the spectrum, the spectrum reading from that. You know source. what I'm catching on this? You know what I'm getting to all this? It's all bullshit. That's oh, what I'm hearing. It's there, we don't but it's know black if the wormholes are there. We don't know. It, it, now everything I see on the Discovery Channel, this fake color. Well, but we keep learning stuff. It's just like the dinosaurs. Um, the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, give or take a couple million years. Um, and, you know, we used to have the idea, you know, they were lizards Mm -hmm. You know, their skin. Da -da -da. And, you know, the more we learn now, it's like, well, 
there were quite a few dinosaurs that had feathery like parts mm. that back when I was a kid there were no feathers uh, we had we had a a reptile that had feathers which is where they thought uh, Archaeopteryx which they thought that's where birds evolved from because what'd you call it again Archaeopteryx I'm pretty sure old people get diagnosed with that when you get older. But, uh, but birds, you know, basically birds descended from dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs really hadn't died out. They just changed a little bit. So when you see ostriches and emus and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, very, very dinosaur-like uh, in their characteristics, reptilian-like. Um, but then you also have uh, uh, the color thing. They used to think dinosaurs were gray, you know, greenish gray, all these dull colors, and now they're starting they're starting to find fossils and things of dinosaurs that still have some pigmentation intact from their skin, and they're starting to learn that dinosaurs actually were much more colorful than they originally thought. So when you see dinosaurs depicted nowadays, you'll find them much more colorful uh, and you'll find quite a few that have feathers that you wouldn't have thought that they had feathers. You know, going back a second to the Voyager, the one thing I didn't know, well, there's a lot of things I didn't know, but I found fascinating is the gold record. Yeah, the, the Voyager had a twofold purpose, um, which is a little questionable in that second purpose but you know <laughs> it was to go by take readings take close-up photos of the moons the planets in our solar system and of course then the the concept was well these things have been shot into space they're traveling at a high rate of speed and they're going to go on forever unless they will continue to move unless acted upon by an outside force so unless they're hit by uh, asteroid, you know, a piece of rock, mm -hmm. a comet, they're just going to keep flying through space forever. So they incorporated um, these gold, well, number one is they have plaques okay. with engravings on them. It's got a man and woman, their hands up saying hello. There's uh, it's a figure of a man, figure of a woman, and they've got their hand up from our thing of saying, hey, Hopefully, whoever finds these out in space realizes that's not a symbol for war. And it's just like saying, hi. Um, Is that a symbol for war in some languages I, or no, cultures already? Oh, no, I don't know. But I just, I just know on the on the plaque, the man and the woman are doing this. It's interesting you say sort that like because how. <laughs> in some languages, I was listening to something the other day, and hello doesn't always mean hello in every, yeah. every language. But yeah. anyway, to yeah. continue. But anyway. The gold records but, and all that stuff. But on the... They've, they've got the, the gold plaque with symbols on it. It's got a it's got a thing showing where the Voyager probes came from, mm -hmm. where we are in the in our solar system. Um, so it's sort of a map as to where these things came from. Which, if somebody or something hostile finds it, we gave them a map to come back and find us. So that's a little disconcerting. But um, they did send out. The, it's got a greeting. The record has a greeting in 86 languages, I think. It's 80 some, but it, it, folks at home can Google that. But yeah, it's got it's got English, French, Spanish. I mean, it's like probably the majority of the languages on our planet just a greeting, like we would say hello. Okay, it would be like a greeting in all the different languages. Uh, what is it? Japanese Konnichiwa. It's uh, you know, it's just. Yes, and uh, I think so. Aloha, you know, just whatever your greeting form is. Right. Um, and then there's also, you remember when the records came out that were movies, and you put them in a big machine, and it was a big disc like a, a record album. But that's what movies they, were. On? Well, they weren't when they first came out. You know, we have DVD little albums yeah. now. But I was in, when, I was in the VHS era well, when I was born. Back in the earlier times when things were just starting, they were big records, and they were like movies, and that's like what was sent out on Voyager. It's a big gold album, but it actually shows scenes from the Earth. It's like a, 
and it's their directions to tell whoever finds this thing <coughs> how to put it in a machine and turn the machine on. So there's instructions. Yeah, there's instructions with the disc on how to put it in and play it. But it like has pictures of like the Taj Mahal. It has pictures of mountain ranges. It has pictures of the Great Wall of China. Uh, it just has like our big earth monuments and things. It's got pictures. I was, on I was looking at this last night just briefly trying to <clears throat> beef up on some stuff, which didn't turn out so well. Um, but <laughs> one of the interesting images was us eating food. It had a picture of like a lady licking an ice cream cone. Like oh, it just yeah. wasn't. Mm, it just, but it wasn't flattering pictures. It wasn't. No. Like, if you saw this picture, you know, looking at it, say, if someone from a different country, you would say, what in the hell are they doing? And why are they looking at the camera with that weird smile? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's it wasn't, uh, I would say it was not our best moment. Wow. Well, Probably a much better image to put up there. There was, I'm sure, a whole committee formed just to pick which pictures to and put on And I'm sure a lot flight. of money wasted on yeah. that. So, so the but the record itself, there is a record player, and it actually works. And that aliens or other life forms or beings can actually listen to the music. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you can actually they not, have different kinds of music. Uh, have you looked it up? From I, I just know it from, <laughs> but they you know they have all different forms of music from different countries. Mm -hmm. You know they they've got like Bach, Beethoven, Beatles. I mean, it's all you know Indian music. Uh, you know, like uh, I want to say, the only song I recognized was "Johnny Be Good" by Chuck Berry. Yeah, yeah, they, they. Everything got a, else was. Yeah, they've I have got no a idea. very wide range, but I think if an alien ever picks it up, they were just trying to give them a little flavor of who we were, uh, Don't or kill who us. we are. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm not always so sure if we should send out invitations, like, well, like. We sort of do that with SETI. We we basically Who? SETI that they listen for alien messages, but we also send out messages. Um, you know what that sounds like to me? What Finding Nemo Dory, who thinks she can talk to the whale. Yeah, yeah. And it's a really <laughs> bad idea when you get swallowed by the whale. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it turns out to be good for her. But, but we there's there's a, a large. Well, they use. A uh, an array of telescopes uh, listening, and they also have the very uh, large listening telescope in Puerto. I think it's in Puerto Rico. Uh, but yeah, they they're always listening out there, trying to find if they can find. A, like we send out radio and TV signals all the time, mm -hmm. so they figure. If there are other worlds out there doing the same thing, sending out broadcast and all these waves, that after a certain length of time, eventually they're going to reach here and we'll pick them up. And then we can know that there's somebody else out there. But so far we really haven't. I mean, they've picked up little blips and stuff here, but nothing confirmed. So, But it is interesting that they're looking at all that. If you could redo the golden record in the playlist, if you could add one song to it, what song would you add for the aliens oh. to hear? Oh, I don't. That's hard to say. Got to pick I'm not one. sure what's all on there. Uh, nothing that we know really. No. Nothing modern. Nothing past 1977. It's the one song. There is no wrong answer. I mean, one of my favorite songs is Thriller. <laughs> well, there you go. What? It'd have to be a Michael Jackson song. Well, okay. Yeah, I like Michael Jackson. Do you think the aliens would hear it and automatically have a groove and start snapping their little alien fingers? Yeah. And then want to moonwalk? Yeah, you wonder. Or do the yeah the, the Thriller <laughs> claw yeah, dance? That would be interesting. But uh, I'm sure they would listen to it and just sort of scratch their head like... Why are they wasting their time on all of this? That's basically when I looked out last night. I think I gave what I expect to be the alien response. Why in the hell did we waste our time on this? Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. Yeah, but f <clears throat> but it's just like everything else. I mean, humans are very unique. 
I mean, we can invent. We pretty much are the one group that... Don't you feel like we used to be inventors, though? Like, we used to invent well, a yeah, lot. Yeah, but like music, I mean, but, you know, we're not the only ones that enjoy music. No. I mean, I see the videos of the birds dancing. Like, the birds will li- will hear music, and birds will dance, and, and monkeys, they'll hear music, and they'll, you know, I've seen a lot of videos of uh, animals getting into What do you think music. it is that relates to the animals? Do you think it's the beat? Do you think it's some sort of rhythm that they mm. hear, they feel? Yeah, I think, well, I think dogs react to, to music and stuff, because, uh, you know, if you play certain music or sirens or whatever, the dogs start howling, mm-hmm. howling along with the music and stuff. Uh, I think it's just, they hear a tone and it, they just hear that howl. They think it's something else that's howling, so they're answering back, but but yeah, birds. I've seen birds dance, or maybe they sing. hear. Maybe well, their brain releases a chemical that makes them happy. And of course, birds. I mean, but birds, their their communication is bird songs, and singing. True. So, and then they we also say well. We call it well songs. Mm-hmm. When whales talk, it's sort of well songs, and so forth. So who knows? Maybe a lot of different animals. Do uh, do music and stuff for their communications are part of it, but it is weird. But I think a lot of animals communicate, and we don't realize they're communicating. Like, oh, I'm sure. Like things they're doing, like the clicks and pops and whistles of a dolphin. Yeah, mean a lot more to the dolphins than it does to us. Right, and they could be even giving each other a look or something. That's yeah. some sort of well, animal, cat, dog, whatever yeah. communication yeah. that we're not even. Well, it's like I was watching a program the other day, and there was a very large bear coming at these two guys, and they were filming, but the bear had been far off. But the bear started coming toward them, and one of the guys was like, kneel down, because they were standing. Uh And he was like, kneel down, and like, you know, like bow down to the bear. And the bear stopped and kept looking at them, and they just sort of stayed in a submissive pose. And the bear just lost interest in them and turned around and walked off. But he said if they had stayed standing up, that's saying one thing to the bear as opposed to kneeling down. So kneeling down kind of discourages the bear or lets the bear feel it's in a dominant yeah. position. Yeah. Or, and like it's not, not being threatened. Right. You're not threatening me anymore. But so if I I'll let stood you go. there... He may have felt threatened and continued to come towards you. And bears are nasty. They're fast. Well, this was a grizzly. It was a big bear. Like, so... You know, and to, I know I've never seen a bear, and I'm okay never seeing a bear. But it's my understanding, like if a bear comes after you, you're kind of screwed because they're fast. Mm. They're going to get a hold of you, and they're basically going to eat your face. Yeah, and everything they have else. Very large canines. Uh, but you're not going to outrun a bear. No, it's not going to happen. Well, it's and like, bears can climb trees, right? Yes. I just feel like that's not fair. So you can't fair. go up a tree, right. get away from it because it'll just come up out of the tree after you. Uh, but yeah, because we, we go to some parks and stuff in the mountains, and there are black bears, and we go to some in Tennessee, and I don't know how the rangers always know. Every time we see a bear, uh-huh. it's like a ranger is beamed in. I maybe mean, they've got them tagged. I don't maybe. maybe, and maybe there are rangers assigned to follow the bears wherever they go. So they, but you know, the ranger will be like, because if the bear has cubs. It's like, yeah, I don't want to get out of your car. You don't want to go take pictures. Do not get near. Because if mama bear feels like you're threatening baby bears, mama bear is going to make you unhappy. I don't know it, but I bet you they're tagged. I bet they have them tagged, and that way they can monitor or uh, uh, track them, almost like GPS-wise, because we've seen bears to know how they travel. Three times, and every time there's been a ranger. I mean, yeah. the minute we see the bear, there's a ranger. And I'm like... How do you always know where the bear is going to be? That has to be it. They have to be. Uh, so they probably have like rangers chip. that are sort of following, like at a distance, but sort of making sure the bears, especially if they get near the roads. Now, grizzly bear is the one you. That's the one you don't want to mess with. I mean, you don't want to mess with any bear. But is it the black bear that's like oof, or is it the grizzly? Well, around here, the only bear we <coughs> have is the black bear. Um, yeah, you have to go to other parts of the country to get into the brown bear, the Kodiak bear, 
the grizzly bears, yeah. Uh, but basically, Alaska, northern, midwestern United States, you have brown bears and grizzlies and so forth. And yeah, those are just ginormous. I've got some friends who have hunted big game. I don't know if they've hunted bears specifically, but I'd like for them to come on and talk about some of the larger game than the deer around here. You know, they've hunted other stuff. Um, it'd be interesting to see if they've hunted bear and what their experience was with, with hunting bear. But, I mean, how? but people, they tell you to, to use bear spray. Like if you go it's camping a, or hiking yeah, somewhere. It's pretty much like a pepper spray. It just, but yeah, you can, you can use pepper spray. And it just burns their eyes like it does a person. And so really? So it just deters them and gets them out of there? Them, yeah. But, yeah, you don't want to get bears or not. But And that's why everybody, I mean, anytime a bear gets anywhere around populated areas, everybody's freaking out. I mean, it's, yeah. on, it's always on the national, like the Charlotte News. Like You can't outrun it. You can't no. outclimb it. But, you know, we've been having bear sightings near here, and you just don't see bears around here. Yeah, for of saw them up on uh, Sharon School Road. Yeah, there's yeah. one sided on Sharon School Road. There's been one down at Huntersville, Cornelius area. Yeah, <sighs> but that but, bear's gonna go wreak havoc on Burkdale. They're not if, gonna know what to do. <laughs> well, if if it's too dry, they're gonna look for water. If there's not enough food where their habitat is, they're going to leave their habitat looking for food because mm-hmm. they're not gonna starve. So. Um, a lot of times, drought and lack of food or destruction of habitat are three things that push them more into areas where we're not used to seeing them. And we've had a pretty wet year. Usually if we have a, a fairly good rainfall, the blackberries, the blueberries, the, the fruits and the stuff in the wild are in good supply. Because they'll eat and, and anything, right? Bears are omnivores like we are. They'll eat, they'll eat whatever. They eat meat, fruit, vegetables. Yeah, they are omnivores like we are. So a bear would probably much rather hang out and chill in the woods and eat berries and plants or whatever else than have As, to come in right, to where we are right. to mess around with us. It'd yeah. much rather just hang out there. And, yeah, and as long as there's water, food, and somewhere for them to live, they're happy. But... If, if any of those three things disappear, they, just like you, I mean, if if something happened to where we were living in a m- more primitive situation mm-hmm. and you were living somewhere and uh, your water dried up and you had eaten all the food that was available, I mean, you're going to move and go somewhere else looking for it because you've got, I mean, you got to have food, water, and shelter. Right. So just like a person would, we would move out looking for more. I mean, it's the way the Indians and, and everything, I mean, they, they would camp one place, use up the resources, and then they would pack up and move somewhere else. Because uh, they, I mean, they had to find food and stuff, so you'd have to go to where the food was. So the bears are just doing the same thing. It's just we're not used to seeing the bears around. No, I don't want to see any more bears around. No. I think I'll go with the no. bears. I mean, the most dangerous thing we have around here, typically, I don't know. I mean, deers usually run away from you. Uh, we don't really have wild boar here, but mm-hmm. you have wild boar in the eastern part of the state. From what I hear, you don't want to run into one of those either. Yeah. That they can be nasty. Um I mean, and I don't. I've heard also the meat's not that great on a wild boar. Could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. and for those of you listening, you could, please feel free to add in the comments if you've eaten wild boar and yeah. uh, how delicious it is. I mean, I've seen it on TV where they hunted them, killed them, and and had a like a pig picking with them. Yeah, but I could be wrong about that. Well, it's probably just like the difference between deer and cow. You mm-hmm. know, some people don't like deer because it does have a a wild taste to it. I mean, it's got a different taste than hamburger. Right. Um, but it also depends on what the animal eats is how the animal tastes. I've true, heard. True. You know, if and you've got a bear that's been eating a ton of like 
campers food and just like crap and cheeseburgers and whatnot the meat's not gonna be that great but if it's been eaten or like if it's been eating like a ton of salmon it's gonna have a gamey taste yeah. to it or well, if it's been eating a lot of berries it's apparently berries like if it's eating a lot of fruits and stuff apparently makes it better better yeah it's a makes better eating the meat, meat better but it's the same thing with cows I mean you sort of have to bush hog and watch what's growing in your fields because we have plants that if a cow eats it it can kill it we have plants like wild onions if if you have wild onions growing in your pastures and the cows are eating wild onion um, be it meat or if it's a milk cow mm -hmm. it, it wild onions mess it up like you can't have dairy cows eating wild onions you would taste the wild onions in the milk it'd be fascinating if Harold would come on here and oh. talk about just the farming and the cows and the meat center and the meat processing. As long as you could deal with cussing, you'll be okay. Uh, well, the, <laughs> luckily here, uh, there are no rules, yeah. so he yeah. can say whatever he wants. Yeah, me, He and I just got in a conversation last night about, because uh, we had been on a cruise, and he was talking about his days in the Navy. Oh. And, and he was like, if you spent years on a ship in the ocean, in the Navy, you really don't really have a desire to go cruising. <laughs> I'm sure not. Yeah, so he's interesting. Uh, and Uncle Louie, with his World War II experiences. He would be, he would be fun to have. He would be, He'd be interesting. interesting. Yeah, a great he, conversationist. He has a lot of stories, he does. But anyway, well, you want to see a few of these things? Well, I think what we're going to do is probably wrap this up. We're okay. going to come back with a part two segment here in a few days. Okay. But, Mark, I appreciate you coming on. Well, I learned a lot. Yes. And, uh, everyone, thanks for tuning in for uh, this episode of Appetite for Discussion. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Bye.